they make it a wasteland and they call it peace. The ability of governments to hide the reality of war behind euphemism when you don't have the images to break that veil of words is tremendous. And we today intend to break that veil of words. What did appear from Artem Mushab? We heard that we should protect victims' humanity. You know, that we don't do this in cases like rape or murder. To which we say, the victims of rape and murder are much closer by us, right? Our moral sentiments reach out to them more easily. We feel more outraged at their deaths than the deaths of Iraqis very far away. And it's only appropriate, therefore, that we use images to close this gap of feeling, to close this gap in our moral caring. Furthermore, we put to you, it's not clear that having these images public necessarily makes it worse for the family. Often seeing the body leads to a great finality that helps them to move on. Furthermore, we put to you, unfortunately for Artem Mushab, most victims of war are anonymous. Most of them are so mutilated as to be unidentifiable, which means that for the vast majority of cases, like, unfortunately for the families, there just is no body before. Furthermore, we put to you, the most survivors of horror want their story told again and again and again. No, thank you. That's why we have from Auschwitz are so ready to show you their tattoo to show these to the news, right? To be able to remind us of the story of what happened. No, thank you. But we think that if most survivors of horror want their story to be told, we think most of the deceased who can't speak because they're dead probably also want that story told so that we can stop it in the future. It respects their wishes. No, thank you. And if we have to sacrifice some of these mythical rights for the dead so we can protect the living in the future from having atrocities visited upon them, that's a price we'll pay. Then we, told, then we were told that this will lead to a race for the most graphic images, to which we say, good, good, because if news corporations across the world are racing to find, no thank you, the worst atrocities, it's much more likely that bad ones get caught and reported, right? That creates sort of positive competition to find things which is most terrifying. But when we put to you that the fact that different news networks will have their reporters dispersed over a battlefield means that very often we get a variety of stories because if you send your reporters all to the same place, you all get the scoop at the same time and you don't get good press. So it's not at all clear that the point was true in the first place. Sir. Then Art said, no, this will encourage more atrocities due to publicity, resting on the incredibly false assumption that people commit atrocities because they want to be rock stars, right? Because they want to be on the international news. No. Generally, when people commit the worst wartime atrocities, they want to cover it up. That's why the mass graves in Cambodia were hidden, rather than put together, no thank you, big markers on top, right? And then, for example, no thank you, makes us more aware of these atrocities, it will make being publicly known for having committed them dangerous. No thank you, because you'll be more likely to be caught and prosecuted, because public opinion may well demand that. So, what do I want to bring you in my case to deal with the rest of what they have to say? No. We put to you that not only will this prevent some of the worst forms of atrocities, we also in improve our ability to hold our governments to account. And this will deal with most of what Rishabh had to say, right? We put to you that the ability of governments to do the most unethical things in war rests on their ability to hide, in a Sir. moment, their belief, what they do behind the veil of words. Yes. Is it not hugely offensive to Muslims to show their dead loved ones on TV and in doing now, so CNN make I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Your right to be offended is somewhat, your right not to be offended is somewhat smaller than the right of the world to know that a genocide has happened and to know it in a visual way that will prevent further genocide. Right? Just very So, we can see that wartime atrocities happen behind a veil of euphemism, right? Pacification means machine gunning villagers to drive them out of the area. Collateral damage means people torn to pieces. Limbs flown apart because of your bombs. Intensive interrogation means Sir. torture. No, thank you. No matter what the American government would like us to believe it means. But we can't show that to the world until we show it on TV. Which is why CNN decided to show what it was like to have Christopher Hitchens waterboarded, massively changed American public opinion on whether or not waterboarding was torture. No, thank you. You pierce that feel of words so that our moral sentiments can see the truth. Furthermore, we put to you that this thing not saying, well, no, you know, you will, we, we think it's really bad for journalists to be in harm's way, to be deep in war zones. It's good for journalists to be in harm's way, because only when they are in harm's way can they catch the atrocities happening. And yes, some of them will be captured. Yes, that will be regrettable. We might have to have a policy that means we think these are part of the harms of the job, and if you're really, really captured and going to be tortured and killed, we might not be able to save you, right? That's perfectly possible, and isn't necessarily a big impediment, no thank you, to the military machine. But having journalists in harm's way is just part of good journalism. Because how else are they going to find these atrocities? What? Like, by telepathy? No. Furthermore, we put to you that there is a principled case, right, that we want to make that this sort of image is necessary for us to make accountable and genuine moral decisions in a democracy. 
This we put to you that you don't make a once and for all choice whether or not to go to war, right? There's no a priori rational basis to quote Bouchard about whether or not you should go into war. You go into war and you have an experience of what it's like. No, thank you. New images and new statistics come up to you. Situations change. You reassess your preferences. There is no once and for all decision. No, thank you. And in order for you to reassess your preferences, you need the kinds of things to be able to make these decisions. And they may say, but, but you've got a right to protect your society, right, from existential threats. So, like, you can censor these images because it make us any kind of fighting wars. Firstly, whether or not a war is an existential threat is itself up to public debate. And that public debate may well, no thank you, be informed by images. But furthermore, even if there is an existential threat, we put to you, very often it's up to the public to decide whether or not, you know, some risk to its existence is worth the price of, say, I don't know, using chemical weapons to make sure that there's no threat, right? So, don't think, no thank you, that say, this might cause you not to wage some wars or automatically wins their side of the case. But we put to you that the best moral decisions aren't dispassionate. Bouchard said the media will tell you what to think by showing you an image. No analysis at all as to why this forces you Sir. to think a particular way. It might make you change your mind, but typically the media changing your mind about a thing, no thank you, is a good thing in the democratic society. It's part of the deliberative process. But the best moral decisions aren't dispassionate because we can't get sort of a priori rational ground on which to intervene in genocide, right? We intervene in genocide even if we can't construct a purely rational reason as to why we should do so. Because ultimately, much of our morality is grounded in our common humanity. It's grounded in that feeling in our breast that says, there's another human being hurt and I need to save them now. And that is lost by that policy. That's why going to Auschwitz, seeing the gas chambers, touching the walls makes you understand the experience in a special way. That's why we think the survivors generally of, say, genocide and, you know, all kinds of racial apartheid have a special story to tell. Because there is a part of their story that transcends the mere facts. A part of the story that humanizes them for you. What we put to you, making a good moral decision isn't just about having a list of facts before you in a spreadsheet. It's about your ability to see past those facts to be human being. And that requires the activation of your moral sentiments. The activation of that inner conscience which leads you to defend humanity. It is that activation which we propose. So what have we shown you today? Firstly, this will lead to better coverage of atrocities, fewer atrocities, better accountability, and in principle, it will lead us to see the common humanity that will lead to fewer deaths and fewer tortures in the world. We're very proud to